for those who, you know, like, this night is like a, a, a night of excitement, but it's also like, tomorrow you know you're, you're going back to it, right? But we're not going back to it the same, and we're not going back to it alone. That is the good and beautiful news. If you're feeling still worn down, like, hey, I've been wanting to break free and, and, and go deeper with the Lord, and I'm, I just feel like I've been, like, maybe running in, in mud, and, and let it happen tonight. Let it happen tonight. You know, oftentimes, you know, we say, let's surrender to the Lord. Let's surrender. But what is surrender? When you are giving in, when you surrender, you go to the one who wins, and they make terms for you of the surrender. You don't go to the victor and say, I surrender under these terms. They dictate the terms by which you surrender. And I think oftentimes we come to the Lord with our terms. This will be how I will surrender in my time, in the way that I feel will serve me best and is most comfortable in this moment for me. And as we know, the Lord never meets us in our comfort zone. We have to take a step. So if you're still feeling worn down, disheartened, you're right where God wants you to be. Because every trial that you've gone through over the last couple of years, maybe things that you've been dealing with for decades, has meaning and purpose. But the thing about it is we try to figure out what those are for, for ourselves, right? We cannot create a purpose for the trials we've gone through on our own. We need to let the Lord speak into us. Speak into those pains, those aches, those wounds. Because they exist in you right now because that's exactly where God wants to manifest his glory. Why did I have to have sore knees why was it so hard for me to, to, to pray? And I've been struggling with that. Because not only did God want to reveal his glory in you, he's revealed it to everybody in this room that God has power over what hurts. Spiritually, physically, mentally, everything. God can bring healing to everything. He is that powerful. There's nothing beyond his ability. And we misinterpret the struggles with, with statements that probably haunt us from our childhood. This is happening because God is not here, or God does not love me, or God is punishing me for my lack of faith, my lack of love, my lack of purity. I deserve this because I'm just, I've blown it. I deserve all the pain that I'm carrying, and I refuse to let it go because it's no longer something that God can bring purpose to. I'm letting it define me. I'm letting it speak to my very identity. It's often in those times when we are struggling, when we can't find the answers, that our faith truly comes alive because we're able to trust God on a level. Like understanding doesn't bring healing. God brings healing. Like when we're struggling, like, okay, God, help me to understand. And God's like, I don't need you to understand. I just need you to trust. Because in that trust comes the healing. Look at the life of Blessed Solanus Casey. I was really blessed. I, w I was in Indiana, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, and I was invited out to lead a retreat for about 20 priests from uh, Indiana. And it was held in Huntington at the St. Felix Friary. And they're like, oh, you're, you're, you we're so happy. To, we're going to give you the, the bishop's suite. Because the bishop had a special room, you know, decked out for him when he, when he went there. And it was like a kitchen and a living room with a big screen TV and this big king size bed. And it was very nice leather. It was nicer than my house. I mean, it was. It was like, hey, this is like, this is like the penthouse suite at the nicest hotel I've ever stayed at. But three doors down the hallway was the little cell that Solanus Casey spent the last 10 years of his life in after he retired from active ministry. And there was a tiny little bed and a tiny little chair. And over that chair, they had draped one of, the, one of his uh, cassocks, you know. And I was like, I, I couldn't help. They had the room, the, the door was closed. You couldn't go in, but they had glass in the door so you could look in and see what his life was like. And I thought, here I am down here in this room, but this is what made a saint. The lack of com comfort the detachment from all the worldly goods. And Solanus Casey had a rough life. 
It wasn't easy for him. His road to priesthood was not an easy road. He entered uh, the St. Francis de Sales uh, uh, Seminary in Milwaukee to study for, to be a diocesan priest. But after he was struggling with his education, uh, his spiritual director recommended that he become uh, a religious priest. So he left uh, the, the seminary and started trying to discern where he was supposed to end up. And he was looking at the Jesuits, he was looking at the Franciscans, and he was looking at the Capuchins. And one night on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, he was praying to the Blessed Mother, and the Blessed Mother spoke to him and said, go to Detroit. And that's where the Capuchins were uh, headquartered. So he left for Detroit, and he studied, and he studied, and he studied. But despite all of his studies, he was not able to uh, get good grades. His grades suffered considerably. Like He was not a good student. And when he was finally ordained, he couldn't pass some of the most basic classes, so they, they, he, was, he was ordained a simplex priest. And he was never allowed to hear confession, and he was never allowed to celebrate, celebrate Mass publicly. And when he was sent to Yonkers, they gave him a job, the, the only job that thought, they thought was fitting for him, which was to be the doorman at the, at the friary there. But Solanus Casey trusted in, that, in this plan, like, if this is the way you want me to live my vocation, I will live it in your love, trusting in your goodness. And, and, and he became this spiritual guru. In his simplicity, he was speaking into the brokenness of the poor and the needy and families that were coming to him in crisis. He had a ministry of comforting people whose sons and daughters were serving in the military. He just had this gift of, of, of communicating God's love and care to everyone he came in contact with. He was able to do mighty deeds of love and God was able to do it through Solanus because he trusted in that love that was given regardless of what he could achieve. We could also look at the life of uh, St. Mark Ji Xingjiang. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, St. Mark Ji. He died an opium addict. He died an opium addict. He did not get cured from his opium addiction in his lifetime. His story is amazing. I don't know if you've heard that. He was a respected Chinese doctor raised by a well-respected Catholic family in China in the 19th century. And he became violently ill with a stomach uh, issue. Uh, they're not really sure what it was, but he started to treat himself with opium, which was the common treatment. And he quickly became an addict. He was, he would, he was in all the way in this, deep in this addiction. Now, he refused to give up, and he tried as hard as he could to fight his addiction, especially by going to confession as often as he could. But his repeated confession and his inability to break from his opium addiction led his confessor to say, you have no true repentance for this sin. I do not want you to receive communion or come back to this sacrament until you're truly sorry and you break this addiction. Now, that seems harsh. They didn't understand addiction the way we do today. But he was left separated from the sacramental life of the church for the last 30 years of his life. And he could have become bitter. He could have become angry, but he showed up anyway. He couldn't receive, but he was there. He showed up at Mass. And when he was there, he would pray, Lord, let me die a martyr. Because he figured it was only going to be through the martyr's crown that he could redeem his sad life of addiction. And in 1900, rebels in the area of China started to round up all the Christians, all the Catholics, all the missionaries, and to persecute and to kill them. He was captured in his village along with dozens of other people, including his own son, his six grandchildren, and two of his daughter-in-laws. Like I said, he never beat his addiction, but in that moment, St. Mark G. was given the grace of total perseverance, not giving up, trusting in the Lord. As they were dragging his, him and his family to the, to the prison, he knew it was coming. And one of his grandchildren said, Grandpa, where are we going? And G. answered him saying, we're going home. And the rebels' edict was clear, renounce your faith or die. And not one of them did. 
G begged his captors. He said, please let me die last because I, I don't want anyone in my family to be alone when they die. The rebels granted him his wish, and he stood by all nine of his family members as they were beheaded, singing the litany of the Blessed Virgin Mary and comforting them before he himself was beheaded. Now, I'm sure as they were walking through the streets to the place of execution, there were probably people looking, thinking, oh, there goes G, the, the, the opium addict. He's going to give in. He'll deny his faith. You just watch. He has no strength of character. He's weak. He's this. He's that. But in that moment, trusting in God's grace, his weakness, in his weakness, he found a strength that allowed him to, to embrace the death in imitation of Jesus Christ for the faith. And how often do we look at ourselves and we just beat ourselves up? And we beat ourselves up. We are so hard on ourselves. We are so damn hard on ourselves. St. Catherine of Siena said, it is strange that so much suffering is caused by the misunderstanding of God's true nature. God's heart is more gentle than the virgin's first kiss upon the Christ. And God's forgiveness to all, to any thought or act, is more certain than our own being. I read that quote for the first time three nights ago, and I just broke down crying. God comes to us and wants to kiss us more gently than the Blessed Virgin Mary first kissed Jesus. How tender the Father's love is for us. And like I said, you know, like we keep wanting to achieve and, 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 and earn the God's love and show God and prove and, and all the things that we feel in our human nature we need to do. But Pope Benedict XVI said it best. He said, it's only in accepting God's love that we come to even know who we truly are. He says, man comes in the profoundest sense to himself, not through what he does, but through what he accepts. And one cannot become a holy man in any other way than by being loved, by letting oneself be loved. We are going to find the healing, the strength, the renewal, everything that we're desirous of through our complete surrender without terms to the love of God. For what he wants to give us more than anything tonight is a deeper understanding of his perfect love, his most sacred heart for us that burns burns deeply for us with that, that divine love. And this is so important for us, especially as we go home and we are in the battle, because this is what, this is what another thing that St. Catherine of Siena said. She said, the devil fears hearts on fire with love of God. He, do, she, he, she, he doesn't fear the self-righteous. Those who, who are on their own uh, strength doing their best, he fears those whose hearts are on fire with the love of God. And I wonder, are we still, still trying to find a way of, of, of receiving that in our lives in, in, in the purest way? And even if we had, are, are we still striving to go deeper, to receive more, to beg of God the grace of the expansion of our heart to receive more of that love? For God is infinite, and we are so finite. He is so generous, and we are so stingy sometimes with love. The reason why God wants to give us his heart is so that we will love with his heart. We will love ourselves with his heart and see ourselves aright and to be able to love those we serve. For those of you who came to the Life in the Spirit, I shared some of my testimony and how in the confessional, through confessing my sins, I received the mercy and love of God for the first time. And one of the things that I needed to, to be healed of is being able to receive love. It wasn't there. I did not see myself as lovable. I did not believe that I was lovable. I thought all my love that was given to me was because I earned it. But as a person, I looked at myself and I saw all my faults, all my imperfections, all my sins, all my brokenness, and thought, I am not lovable. And, and in high school, I was insecure, and even though I was very accomplished, I was one of the captains on the football team, I was on the National Honor Society, 
everything that I was doing was a performance-based act to try to get people to like me, to get, try to get people to love me. There, I, there, nothing was coming from a place of, I want to give. It was all about trying to find a way of, of being comfortable in, 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 when I looked at the mirror and liking what I saw. And it wasn't until the healing love of God entered my heart. I describe it like this. At that moment of my conversion, God put a snapshot of his love on my heart, a, a, a pure, clear picture. And I can't describe it to anybody because it, it, it's just too glorious. And there's been times in my life when, when, when I've been struggling and struggling to continue to give more of myself to God and receive more of his love. And it's always in prayer where God takes me into this path where I'm now sitting there just staring at that picture and being reminded that I'm loved by God. It's, it's an indelible mark that's put on my soul. We talk about how we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The seal that God put on my soul was an image of his love, and he revealed it to me. And when I close my eyes and go to prayer, I can see it, and it still makes me cry. That doesn't mean that 24-7 I'm walking on cloud nine feeling this love and just like, oh, man, I wake up and the angels are singing, and there's like little cherubs, fat little cherubs floating around my, my, my bedroom saying, good morning, John. It's going to be another great day. Like, you know, like, it's like, but, but when I need to, and I need to pause and just say, okay, God, remind me of who I am. It's like, you know, you pull out that old picture that you keep in your wallet or that picture you keep on your phone, and you just look at it, and it reminds you of something good. And this reminds me of the best thing. We all need to know this. I was a youth minister for 15 years before I came back to Francisco University. I was serving at a parish down in North Carolina. I had this young kid in my youth group named Tony. Tony was... 13 years old, and he first discovered pornography on the internet when he was 11. At first, he was like every 11-year-old boy, curious. What is this? Oh, my gosh. What is that? Oh, my gosh. And as he described it, though, it became more, it wasn't just like occasionally coming across it by accident, because most people come across it by accident, but they get pulled in. But within six months of his first discovering it, he was going home and looking at it for hours, cutting himself off from friends, cutting himself off from his family, feeling more and more disgusted with himself and feeling shame and dirty and broken. And I was hosting a retreat, and on Saturday night at the retreat, our pastor came out. We were going to expose the Blessed Sacrament, and he and our associate pastor were going to hear confessions. And we're getting the room set up. We're getting ready to roll. Jesus is going to be coming in in a few minutes. And Tony comes up to me. He goes, I'm going to call my mom to come pick me up. I want to go home. I said, why? He's like, I don't belong here. I'm like, why? He goes, you don't understand. If you knew what I was doing, you'd know why I don't belong here. Remember, this kid's 13 years old. He didn't know God. He didn't know mercy, but he knew this. He was dirty and broken because that's what the voice in his head, the enemy was telling him over and over again. You don't belong here. And I just stopped. I said, come Holy Spirit, in my, under, in my heart. And I just, I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, Tony, don't leave. In a few minutes, Jesus is going to be in this room. Whatever you're dealing with, just lay it before him and say, Jesus, you speak to my heart tonight. What do you have to say about me? Who do you say I am? The same question that we were presented with this morning. And so, you know, he sat down in the room, and, and, and I'm kind of making sure that the con confession stations and everything's running smoothly. I'm kind of MC and directing, make, directing. And uh, I turn around. I have a conversation. I'm looking around. Jesus comes in the room. We start praying. The music's playing. Everything's going well. Uh, I, I want to go check in on Tony, and he's gone. He, he wasn't in the room. And so I went out on the porch, thought I'd find him there. We went there. I walked around this whole big lodge that we were having this session in. Couldn't find him anywhere. Went to look in the bathrooms. He wasn't there. Ran up to his cabin. He wasn't there. Ran back to the main lodge. Walked in, and there he was on his knees before the Blessed Sacrament, bawling his face off. Tears just pouring down his face. And I went up to him. I said, Tony, you scared me. I thought you'd left. 
goes, no, I didn't leave. I went to confession because as soon as I sat down, I looked at Jesus and I said, Jesus, tell me who I am. And Jesus said, I love you and I want to set you free because you're my son. And I got up and I ran to the confession and I just confessed all my sin to the priest. He forgave me and I am clean and I have hope. And he could not stop crying like, because God just broke into his life. And sometimes we're like that. We've got these wounds and they, they wear us down and, they, and, and, and we just become acceptance of this is my new normal. Maybe at one point in my life, I could have been happy-go-lucky or full of joy, but, you know, life is a lot more serious for me now, and I've got my burdens, and I'm just meant to carry these crosses. And yes, God can free somebody, but He's not going to free me. It's my job to manage my pain and to try to get through this life. Even if I have to limp, I'm going to continue to limp with you, God, but I'll just accept that this is just going to be the way it is from here on out. When God is like, no. You broken, limping, suffering, struggling is not the new normal by which we're supposed to live because God is a God of freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We, are to be, we, we need to step into it. We keep going to God and saying, like, God, I will come before you, but I can't let go of this right now. I, can, I can't completely surrender. We come to God with these terms because we fail sometimes in our woundedness to maybe realize that the most important thing that the Lord needs to heal in us is our trust in his goodness. I know for me, the Lord has continually gone there in my life and allowed me to experience trial after trial that continues to make me trust in his goodness. Why? Because we need to be led there. It's sometimes it's, it's fundamental wound. And it talks about this in the Catechism, Article 39, 3, Article 397. It says, man tempted by the devil let his trust in his creator die in his heart and abusing his freedom disobeyed God's command. This is what man's first sin, first sin consisted of. All subsequent sin would be disobedient toward, disobedience toward God and a lack of trust in his goodness. All sin and disobedience towards God is rooted in a lack of trust in his goodness. The first thing to die in the garden was trust in the heart of Adam and Eve. And that's why the enemy works so hard to make it the last thing that we want to deal with. Because if God can heal our trust in him and restore our complete faith a childlike faith in God's goodness. To believe like little children, we stand before him with our hands in, our, in the air saying, Daddy, that he's going to swoop down and pick us up and, and, and draw us to his heart. And love us for who we are. So often in our culture of misplaced trust and broken promises and damaged lives, we need to be reminded and we need to, like the prodigal son, come to our senses and run back to our father. And say to Jesus that you are the unshakable, unchangeable, unbreakable. That Jesus, you are worthy of all my trust. And if we can't get there, just say, Holy Spirit, pour you the grace to get there upon me. Because sometimes that's the first thing that we have to understand. It's like, I can't even get there without the power of the Holy Spirit. So just send that Holy Spirit, Lord, that gives me that step to, to come to my senses and run to the Father. I believe the Lord wants to come and heal our wounded trust. We have seen so many things fall apart. We've seen the nature of our vocation transformed before us. The things that we thought we could rely on are gone. But didn't we just pray in the, you know, in the, the, uh, um, in the night prayer? Let's not trust in man. What is worthy of our trust? Where should our trust be? It should be in Christ alone. And Jesus trusted the Father perfectly. With all his heart, he made straight for us a path that we would be able to imitate that trust. Mary, our mother, her complete surrender, she had perfect faith and hope and trust in the Father. And through this great grace, she was able to believe and trust without fail. And she can help us as her spiritual sons to learn how to walk that path. I have five children. I taught them all to walk. 
they all fell down a lot. And when they fell, I didn't go up to them and kick them and say, you stupid baby, he's walking. It's not that hard. Just watch. You know, you, you know, you, as a dad, you scooped all you could do it. You're, you're like, you, you sound really ridiculously stupid when you talk to your children. Oh, you, 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 could, do, you, could, do, you, you could do it. You know, you're like, and, and, but you get down on their level and you look them in the eye and you say, I, let's do it. And you let them try again. And they fall again, you scoop them back up. And that's how they learn to walk. And that's how we're going to walk and learn to walk this walk of faith and trust. This childlike trust is when we start letting God Stop saying, look, look what I can do for you, God, and say, okay, God, teach me how to truly walk this path. Blessed Mother, teach me to truly walk the path of faith and trust. Trust involves a choice to surrender our, our fears, our wills, our very life. It's a deliberate, intentional, from the deepest part of us, a surrender. But it is also a grace. The Catechism clearly teaches in Article 154, it says, believing is possible only by grace in the interior helps of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to get to that place of faith and trust by trying to conjure up a feeling within us. Okay, God, I trust you tonight. No, no, it's when we like, okay, God, trust is a grace. I choose to receive that grace, and I choose, choose to move in that grace, to live in that grace, to claim that grace, to accept that grace. Fill me with that. We don't have to perform. And today, more than ever, we each need radical faith, a faith that is a profound personal decision to cling to God alone, to God alone, to God alone. What other things are you, in your life are you using as crutches right now when God wants to teach you to walk without your crutches? What things do you need to let go of? And when we let go of these other things, God is then able to teach us to truly walk because as long as we have crutches, I mean, there's always that point in somebody's therapy when the doctor says, put down the crutches and start walking. You don't need them anymore. That's going to be the path of healing. You're still going to need a boot on your foot for a while. You, you're gonna, but eventually you're going to have that. And now you're going to be able to do some light exercise. But sooner or later, you're going to be back on the field playing at full strength. We want to just like, okay, God, I just want to go out on the field with my crutches and see what happens. You know, like, no, let him go. Let God restore. I find myself more and more like praying, not for like, like the outlandish, courageous, like manly beat on my chest. Look at me, God, watch me go. I'm, I'm, I'm like saying, Father, you see my limits. My lack of trust that's in my heart at times. You know the hardness of my heart that wants control, that doesn't want surrender. But Lord, you see me like you saw Zacchaeus, like you saw Bartimaeus, like you saw Peter, sinful and broken and in need of your love, in need of your healing. Father, touch my heart with your peace, with your power with your healing. Change my heart like you changed Zacchaeus' heart. Open my eyes like you opened Bartimaeus' eyes. Restore Peter the way you restored Peter after he fell three times. Lord, be gentle with me, but, but be firm. I want to stop diagnosing and prognosing and, 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 and prescribing for me and myself the way I'm going to become the saint I want to be. I'm going to let that ambition go and just say, okay, God, form me. Let me truly be clay now. Let me keep my own hands off the clay and let you touch me, form me, make me the man I'm supposed to be. Not, the, not even the man, even though it might be a really good image, not the man I want to be, but the Lord, the Lord, the man you need me to be, the man you created me to be. And I need you to restore, Holy Spirit, my trust in the Father to do this. I need you where I'm hard to come with the water of the Spirit to soften the hardness of that soil. Where I'm impure, I need you to come with the fire of the Spirit to, to, to strengthen and purify. Jesus, only you can save me. 
I find myself praying this way, this complete surrender. Because after 40 years of walking in the Lord, I realize I've done most of it mediocre, and some of it I've done just completely wrong. Because I had still, for too long, held on to my ideals. It's like, this is who I wanted to be, and that became like an idol for me. That's what I served, this vision of my life. And the Lord's like, that's not who I want you to be. Just trust and let go. And with that comes the peace. You know, and it takes time. Like, I'd like to say, oh, man, I started praying this a couple years ago, and everything's just clicking. The, 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 the onion of my heart has lots of layers, and God's keep peeling more and more of them back. Keep going, he keeps going deeper into me, transforming it little bit after little bit. Um, and that's what he wants to do for each one of us. You know, he, uh, that's what he wants to do for each one of us. Now, God will never give you more in this journey than, than you can handle. He will ask of things of you that will exceed your capacity. Which, what all I mean by that is, he's going to allow you to experience things that are going to make you cry out to the Lord and trust him with, with the results. He's going to ask you to do things that are beyond your capacity, but not beyond your ability. Because all we need to do is to realize that in God's perfect will, his number one goal in all that has happened to you and all that he's doing in you is that you'd be drawn up into his love and transformed by his embrace and, and, and respond to that movement of grace and go to witness to other people what he's doing in you and through you, to this broken and sad world. You know, I spent the first part of my uh, career in ministry saying to young people the words of St. Paul to Timothy, do not let people look down on you, but you you're of your, because of your youth. You don't let people say you're too young. And now I've kind of flipped it. Do not think for one minute you're too old for God to start this process anew in you. Never in our lives are we beyond God's plan. You have not lived long enough to outlive God's plan for you. You did not come with an expiration date. It's all fresh with God because God exists out of time. He can even go back in your life and heal things that happened 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, 10 years. All, anything is, is under his power because it, it, in his, in our mind, we're linear creatures. We have a start and a finish. God is there. He's here. He's everywhere at the same time in the, in everywhere. And I don't want to get too geeky. Maybe it's like a multiverse of, of, of craziness, but God can go to any part of our lives and bring healing. In the past, and he definitely is waiting for you tomorrow and the next day and the next day to give you that glorious future. You did not miss God's chance to live out his plan to the fullness. The next great chapter of your life can begin tonight. I love, like, the Lord of the Rings because there's lots of characters that are woven in and out of the story. Some are major characters and some are minor characters, but even the small characters have great things to, to say and great things to do as, par, as part of this story. And there is a great chapter where God is going to do something great in you and through you because he wants you to be able to in imitation of our blessed mother to say, people call me blessed because the mighty God has done great things for me. People want to be able to say, you are a blessed person. And we should be able to say, yes, I am blessed. As Deacon Ralph would say, I'm blessed by the best. Because we are, because the mighty one has done great things for us. And tonight we're going to let him do some more. Amen. You know, I've, I've told this story before, and I know some of you have heard it, and I'm not going to tell all the details, but it was five years ago. I was at a conference in Rochester, Minnesota, when I got a call from who, from who at the time was my son Andrew's girlfriend. They had just been in a car accident, and she had been on the side of the road 
cradling him in his arms with her hand across the forehead, his forehead because a car coming the opposite direction, the driver fell asleep, crossed the center line and hit them head on. And my son was in the back seat, lying down flat on the back seat without a seatbelt on. She was in the front wearing her seatbelt and the airbags. She had another friend who was in the front seat, seatbelt airbag. They walked away. One, she had like a, her friend had a broken ankle. She didn't have a scratch on her, but my son took the full force of impact of him going forward right here. He had 19 fractures and his head was split open and she cradled into his arm, holding, trying to hold it all in as he was bleeding on the side of the road, waiting for the helicopter to arrive that was going to take him to the hospital. After he had gotten taken care of and was on his way, she called me and she was hysterical. She had no idea where they were taking him. They said a hospital in Pittsburgh, but she didn't remember the name. And, she, and, and, and I said, well, okay, just take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. I'm going to call my wife. She'll, she'll know how to help, and she'll, she'll be in contact with you. So I called my wife, and I said, Andrew's been in a car accident. I don't know what hospital it is. Start calling the hospitals in Pittsburgh as you're driving. Get there. When you find out anything, let me know. I'll be there as quickly as I can. I'm scrambling in my hotel room. This was about noon. I go back to my hotel room. I'm going through my phone. What's the next flight that'll get me out back to, 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 to Pittsburgh? And it wasn't until the evening that I could get out of Rochester. So I drove from Rochester up to St. Paul to the main airport, got on a plane that was going to get me home by 9, got to the airport, the flight's delayed. I did not leave, uh, I did not leave Minnesota until 10 o'clock that night. And all the while, you know, like, as I was walking through the airport, I felt like this zombie. And I know I was saying excuse me a lot to people. You know, I have a tendency to get impatient when I'm in, in crowds, and I want, I like to walk fast, and I don't like it when people get in my way. But that night changed my whole perspective because... I was that guy. You know, we don't know what people are going through when we encounter them, right? But that night I was so broken. And, and sometimes that person who just seems to be moving in such a way, like, get it together. That, they could have been going through what I was going through. I, I, it's taught me a level of compassion. But, I, but I, as I was in the airport, I was texting all the different conference hosts that we had because we had six conferences going on. And on Saturday night at our conferences, they have holy hours. And so I asked them, just have way home. I don't know what I'm going to find when I get there. I don't know if he's dead or alive. You know, he's, he's going in for surgery. There's all this surrender, all this, okay, God. And that night, there were over, like almost 12,000 high school students across the United States and Canada praying for my son before the Blessed Sacrament. I didn't land in Pittsburgh till 2 o'clock in the morning. And at that point, I couldn't have gotten into the intensive care unit. My wife had already come home for the night. So I just said, I'm, you know, when I, I landed, I just said, I'm coming home. Let's just sleep. We'll get up first thing in the morning. We'll go. We'll deal with it. So we woke up. I went to bed, fell asleep around 2.30, got up at 5.30, took a quick shower, got in the car with my wife and drove to Pittsburgh. My son was lying there, tubes coming out of both his arms, ventilated, head wrapped because not only did his head split open, but they had to do an emergency craniotomy. They took almost the top third of the left-hand side of his skull off, and there was a tube coming out of his head draining blood. His face, you ever see the Rocky movies? After Rocky gets his face beaten in by Apollo Creed or Ivan Drago or whoever he's fighting, Clubber Lang. That's what he looked like. He looked like he did 10 rounds with each one of them. And I just fell on my knees, put my hands on his chest and said, come Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, just come with your grace. I mean, I just completely just, I just remember just being drawn to my knees and just crying out to God, this is my son. And thinking this is, must be what the father felt like as he looked down at, on his son being crucified the, the damage that was wrought to him. And I was just like, oh, Lord, just come with your spirit. Come with your grace. Later that morning, the doctors came in to talk to my wife and I, and they sat us down, and they were very stern and very solemn. And they said, we've seen this kind of injury many, many times. 
it may be weeks before he wakes up. And when he does, he might not remember who you are. He might not remember how to speak. We're not sure. We won't know the extent of his injury until he wakes up. But I would be prepared for months, if not years, of rehabilitative therapy for him. And as the doctor's saying this, there was no panic in my heart. But just it was, what was impressed upon me is, okay, God, all I ask for in this moment is the grace to accept whatever I have to do to get my son better. I, I mean, I don't know why this prayer was in my heart because I would have been like, okay, God, you've got to, you, you owe me a miracle. He better get out of that bed. You better take care of this. I have spent my whole life serving you and sacrificing for you. You better come through with a miracle. But in that moment, all I could say is, God, whatever it takes, whatever sacrifice I need to make, whatever time, money, effort, nothing, I will, I will do it. Whatever it takes, God, just give me the grace. That's all I ask. The next morning, they had taken out his breathing tube because uh, they had, had him on the breathing tube because they had him on so many anti-seizure medicines because of brain injury that they didn't want him to be pulling out his IVs, but they determined he was past that point, so they, they took out the breathing tube, and so he was able to breathe on his own, but he hadn't said anything, he hadn't woken up, he hadn't, and my daughter Madeline was with us, and we had already prayed a number of rosaries. We had a number of priests come by. We, he had already received, you know, the anointing of the sick but, and many blessings. And we had prayed the rosaries a couple of times by his bed. And, and everyone was taking turns just being there and, and holding his hand and telling him that we loved him. And my daughter Madeline was there, who she's a nurse. And so, you know, the accident was really brutal. He had blood on his face. He had blood oozing out of his eye socket because it was so damaged. And uh, she just took a wet rag, got some warm water on it, and just kind of like was cleaning him up taking the blood that was in his ear that had pooled in his ear and kind of wiping it out, doing whatever she could just to clean him up a little bit and talking to him, Andrew, it's going to be okay. And it was such a beautiful thing to see her love and care. But as she's doing this, Andrew starts to flinch. Like he's like annoyed. And, and Madeline's like, Andrew, just sit still. I'll be done in a minute. She's like, continue wiping him off. And he just kind of looked up and he opened his one good eye and he goes, will you please stop that? Because it is a proven fact that there are two powerful things in the, in the universe, more powerful than anything else, right? One, the power of prayer. Second, the power of a sibling to annoy another sibling. <laughs> it can raise a sibling from the dead, bring them out of a coma. Stop touching me. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. But we all just like stood there. We all picked our jaws up off the floor. We called for a nurse. The nurse came in, asked my son, what's your name? Andrew, where do you live? Steubenville, Ohio. Why are you here? I don't know. Where am I? You know, like, he couldn't remember the accident. But he, 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 do you know your siblings' names? Madeline, Catherine, John Paul, Therese. Like he's like all naming all of us. You know, like, and we're like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Now, he doesn't remember the first two weeks after his accident, but I do. And I watched miracle after miracle after miracle from him getting out of the intensive care into a regular room, getting out of that room into the long-term rehab, which he spent all of 10 days in. Before they told me, there's nothing more we can do for your son. He is fine. Take him home. We do ask that you would take him into ongoing re rehabilitation on an outpatient basis. So I sign him up. I take him to two sessions with the outpatient rehabilitation therapist, and they're like, you're wasting your insurance company's money. We're not helping him. He's fine. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't residual effects from the accident, but I will tell you this. A year and a half later, he finished up his master's in business from Francis University. He's currently taking nursing school courses because of the, the, he, he's going to be a nurse. He works at a hospital down in Wheeling. In the midst of our trials, what the Holy Spirit taught me, what the, in the midst of our trials, we need to do the right things and stop doing the wrong things. We need to stop asking the wrong questions. Does God really love me in all this? Is he present? 
Is he, does he even care? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? What mistake did I make? What did I do to God to piss him off so much that this is how he treats me? Or who's, who's to blame for this? Somebody is making my life hell. Who's to blame? We need to ask the, the, the right questions of God. Lord, how are you calling me to grow? What are you wanting to teach me in the midst of this? What grace do you want to bless me with in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this struggle? What grace do you want to bless me with? How am I called to face this situation with that grace, O oh Lord? Because those are the questions that he will answer. I will tell you, God could have come down and told me exactly why my son had to go through that accident and explain to me with little words, because I would have needed him to do little, little words for me to understand. And it would not have comforted me one bit. It was the surrender to say, God, whatever you want, whatever it takes, just give me grace. Just give me grace. I, you will see me through this. And people were coming up to me saying, man, your family's handling this so well. How are you doing? How is this happening? And I remember talking to God about this. I said, you know, God, this is such a grace-filled moment. Why are you, are, are you blessing me so incredibly much? And, and the Lord said to me, you know, John, you know all those times you got up in the morning and you prayed your rosary and you, and you spent time talking with me and you didn't feel like I was there and you were wondering if I was there? Yep. I remember those, Lord. Yeah, and you remember all the times that you got up and you prayed and, uh, you know, you felt nothing. And you, but you did it anyway. And you didn't want to get out of bed. You wanted to sleep, but you got out of bed and prayed. You remember all those times? Like, yep, Lord. He goes, in those moments, I was preparing you for this. In the, our intimacy with Jesus Christ, he will release the grace that we need to face all the challenges that are coming because I have a feeling that things are not going to get better in the near future for any of us. It's not going to get easier to be a priest. It's not, easier, it's not going to be easier to be a man of faith, a man sold out to, to, for God and his glory in our world. It's not going to get easier. But if we remain rooted in Christ, if we remain surrendered to the power of the Holy Spirit, not only will God come into our lives and bless us, he will heal us of all things. For me, I did need healing for that. I had so much anger when I got the police report and read the name of the, of the guy who was driving the other car. The first thing I did is I went to all the social media I could find and tried to get a profile of him because I was going to figure out like how much I could sue him for. I was, I was just, I'm so, I was so angry. Like my son shouldn't have to deal with this. And I thought I was very righteous. And the Lord just spoke to me, he just said, what are you doing? You know, when we get resentful and angry like that, it's like drinking poison and expecting our enemies are going to die because of it. But we're only killing ourselves. And I was like, okay, Lord, I know. I'm, I, help me to let go. And it didn't happen in a moment. It was a process. It took a, a couple of weeks for the Lord to really get me to a point where I could even surrender it. And even after that, still like the residual effects of that kind of anger in my life just to let go of it. But there's, there's healing on every level for us. And actually, in the end, you know, like my son and I, we started praying for him, you know, together. We were praying for this kid and for his recovery because he was pretty banged up in the accident too. And, and after my son had received all this grace, he was like, yeah, we need to pray for him, Dad. Because I've been blessed. He needs to be blessed. And that was like such a great thing to help me let go and just like turn all the, the feelings I had from, from being angry with him to love and, and let God transform him, you know? We don't always get our desired outcomes when we pray. What we do get is God and his goodness. And tonight, maybe the idea, like Father Day said, is like, let's come to God without desired outcomes. Let's not get in the way. Let's not come to God with an agenda. Let's ask God to come and do what we need him most to do. And maybe that's first going to our place of trust and saying, I want to restore. And give you even a stronger belief in my goodness. A stronger trust in who I am. A childlike faith again. To start anew. 
to be restored. And as we go through this night, there are going to be specific ways that God's going to want to enter, enter in your life and heal more things. But let the Spirit reveal. Let the Spirit lead. And as the Spirit shows you what needs to be healed in our lives, let us not run, but let's, in humility and trust, surrender completely and without terms. Amen? Amen.